first speaker is uh, Dr. Thomas uh, Insel. Let me just tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he's the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, uh, the component of the National Institute of Health. And he's charged with a pretty important job, which is generating the knowledge uh, needed to understand, treat, and prevent mental disorders. Uh, his tenure at NIMH has been distinguished by groundbreaking findings in the areas of practical clinical trials, autism research, and the role of genetics in mental illnesses. And prior to his appointment as NIMH director in the fall of 2002, Dr. Insel was professor of psychiatry at Emory University. He's the founding director of the Center for Behavioral Neuroscience, one of the largest science and technology centers that's funded by the National Science Foundation, and concurrently director of the NIH-funded Center for Autism Research from 1994 to 1999. He was director of the Yerkes Regional Primate Research Center in Atlanta. So he has a really distinguished career of uh, numerous publications and books, and, and he's here to really share with us some important insights in the area of autism. Join me in welcoming Dr. Insel. Well, thank you very much, Tony. Can you hear okay in the back? I'm not sure how long this goes. Okay, <coughs> let me uh, break one of the first rules of the TED Talks and, and uh, show you, actually bring up some slides, which we tend not to do for TED Talks, but in this case, I thought it would be useful. I wanted to really focus on the question about um, what can we really say about autism at this point in 2012. There has been so much controversy on this topic, and I know this hasn't been a central theme for uh, council meetings in the past, but I thought that uh, you should at least get quickly up to date with what we do know, and by reference to that, uh, maybe have a chance to ask questions and think with me about what we don't know. First of all, let's just uh, make sure we're talking about the same thing. This is defined as a triad of symptoms. You see the near reduced social behavior, uh, abnormal or sometimes no language whatsoever, uh, and then repetitive movements that look somewhat worse than what you might see in a compulsive disorder. These are really stereotypic movements often. Uh, the key is that these have to be present by age three to make the diagnosis. But in reality, what happens is that most children who have these three also have lots of other issues and problems. Sometimes it's these kind of additional associated features that are even more problematic for families. Seizures, uh, severe intellectual deficits, terrible gastrointestinal problems that we don't fully understand. Many of them have uh, abnormal facial features and, uh, and a certain number, they seem to do very well for the first 18 months of life and then regress quite quickly. We don't know whether this is one disorder, we don't think so, and increasingly we talk about the autism, the idea being that autism is maybe more like talking about fever, and there could be many, many different disorders incorporated within that. Part of the controversy that we deal with is that for some people, autism is a disorder, for some it's a disability, and for some they see it as an injury, and each of those requires quite different responses. And what I'd like to try to convey to you as a big idea, as Tony said, is that we can now think of this as a disorder that can be treated. Uh, and that is a change from considering it simply a disability which can go through rehabilitation, like other forms of intellectual deficits, or an injury for which we just need compensation. It's a spectrum. One end, we're talking about classic autism. Uh, people are often nonverbal. Uh, and they show various severe stereotypes like hand flapping. At the other end, you have what's often called Asperger syndrome. This is actually uh, the, hardly a disorder. It's people who may be more interested in machines than, than social stimuli, but they may function extremely well, uh, and particularly in the digital age, may be uh, uh, very, very successful. So, what do we know? Uh, first of all, Increasingly, as I said, we think about this as a developmental brain disorder. Uh, we now are able to map what's changing in the brain, what isn't across early development, and ask what makes autism, the autism brain, different. Um, remarkably, not much. The brain looks normal, grossly. In fact, conspicuously normal, even in children who may lack language, have seizures, and have these uh, severe um, social deficits. Most Children, most infants and most infant brains seem to be developing pretty normally for the first year of life, but there's a period of that normal growth, uh, brain growth that starts late in that year and is evident through the second year. Uh, and there's at least a theory now that what's going on in autism is that there are too many long connections and not, not enough 
I'm sorry, too few strong connections and not enough short ones, leading to abnormal processing of information. That remains very much a theory. We also think that genetics is an important part of this, but only part of it. Uh, we think that because there are true genetic diseases like fragile X that have about 30% prevalence of autism within them, so uh, autism can be part of a Mendelian or genetic disease like that. We think it because monozygotic twins who share 100% of the DNA have a much higher likelihood of having, uh, uh, having concordance. If one of them has autism, the other one will as well, relative to dizygotic or paternal twins where only 50% of the DNA is shared. We think it because there actually are genes now that have been associated with autism, that almost every one of those, interestingly, are genes for proteins in the synapse, and also proteins important for brain development. And we think this because um, autism is about four times more common in boys than girls in virtually every study that's been done. Importantly, treatment works here, and it's, it, it works especially, we're talking about carrying out behavioral interventions if they're started early. And an extremely important paper published last year in which behavioral intervention was started at 18 months ago and continued right into about age four. Uh, about half of the children showed a profound improvement, even children who were uh, quite disabled. Uh, and about 10 or 15 percent lost the diagnosis altogether. So this is a very different picture than one might say for neurodegenerative disorders like uh, the dementias. Um, these kids, many of them do get better, but they only get better with intensive, extensive, and sometimes very expensive behavioral treatments at this point. And right now, we do not have a medical treatment that is a medication for the core symptoms, though we do have medications for some of the associated symptoms. What's so vexing here is that this is many disorders, and we don't know yet how to separate them out. So we don't know how to predict who's going to respond best to behavioral interventions. And finally, what is perhaps uh, one of the most uh, challenging and I think controversial issues in this field is the evidence that the prevalence is increasing. And we know this from work from the uh, Centers for Disease Control. Uh, 20 years ago, the prevalence that we all looked at was about 1 in 1,500. When I started in this field 30 years ago, autism was considered a very rare disease. Uh, today, it doesn't look like that. So there have been a series of CDC reports, as well as this report from HRSA, putting all the data together, the most recent numbers, which were published about two weeks ago, looking at children who were eight years old in 2008. So this is a cohort that was born in the year 2000. One in 88 was the number. That's up from one in 1500 from 1992. And if one looks at the data from California for the Department of Developmental Services, you can see that there's just a very striking and almost linear increase going up about 13% every year, accounting for about a 12-fold increase in the rate of autism from 1987 to 2007. Um, this is not simply due to changing diagnosis, at least in the developmental services data, because you can see that there is no concurrent increase or change in mental retardation, epilepsy, or cerebral palsy. If all of those went down at the same time that autism was going up, you'd say, well, this is just diagnostic, diagnostic substitution. But that's really not the case. What is driving this? Well, we actually don't know entirely. Some of it is due to changes in the diagnostic criteria. Uh, some of it's due to better ascertainment. And some of it is due, we think, really to have better <coughs> services so that more children do get uh, a diagnosis of autism and get the services they need. We don't know if there is an epidemic, which is what has been suggested, that is a real increase in the number of children affected rather than just an increase in the number detected. Uh, we think that there are some things that could drive that. Certainly, um, having higher paternal age is associated with an increase in the risk for having a child grow up with autism. But it's not a huge increase, and that probably is not going to drive the 12-fold increase that I just showed you. Uh, environmental factors are what everybody's thinking about. But at this point, well, we have found some genetic factors that seem to be important. We have not yet found the smoking gun for an environmental factor, at least for a single environmental factor, that looks like it's a major driver. 
But this is incredibly important to disentangle. We need to figure out how much of this is due to actually more children affected, because it changes the way you begin to look for where the problem is and what you can do potentially to prevent this uh, really astounding rise. So just to finish up, uh, let me go through what I think we can say that we also know is not true. Uh, first of all, we can say now conclusively that the ideas of the 60s, 70s, and 80s that autism was caused by bad parenting can be truly excluded at this point. We can say that the idea that autism was caused by thimerosal and vaccines can be truly excluded at this point. Thimerosal is 90% of it or more, came out of all vaccines in about 2000 and 2001. There's no evidence that the rate of autism has gone down concurrently. We could say that it's uh, not caused by a single gene, which is something that we thought for a long time. Uh, we thought this was because of the heritability, the high rate of concordance in monozygotic twins. We thought we may be able to find uh, a major genetic cause. That does not look like it's going to be the case, although uh, there may be many, many genetic causes that contribute. And I think we can say with some assurance that this is not a simple or single disorder. So that's, uh, I think, uh, equally important for us to remember. So a quick summary of what I've just told you. Uh, what we know is that it's a developmental brain disorder. Genetic factors are important because males are more uh, affected than females. And environmental factors almost certainly play a, a role. But to the extent that we know what those are, the ones that we have looked at, and that do seem to be contributing almost all prenatal, particularly in the second trimester. So that's where most of the search is going right now. Early behavioral interventions are critically important, and it's critically important that they happen early. The earlier they happen, the better the outcomes, and the prevalence has increased now to 1 in 88. We don't know, I should just clarify, what the actual prevalence is in the population. In a population-based study that is going door to door and screening very carefully in a city in South Korea, uh, done to be sort of representative of a suburban area of the United States, the rate was actually much, much higher than what we're citing here at 1 in 88. It turned out to be, in that case, 1 in 38, 2.3 or 2.4 percent of rate of autism. Only a third of those children had ever gotten a diagnosis. And so it may be that the actual rate goes from 1 in 1,500 to 1 in 150 to 1 in 88. It's possible that we're only about halfway to detecting the cases that are actually out there. We don't know that. But the one thing I think we can say, without any doubt at this point, is that services will be a national challenge for all of us, for everyone, as we get these a million children, uh, roughly a million, who now have a diagnosis of autism and become more than a million adults with a diagnosis of autism. Um, issues around housing, issues around employment, issues around medical care, issues around long-term supports, are going to become more and more a uh, national crisis for us unless we think ahead and we think with the families who are already thinking about this, about what we can do to make sure that these kids who have real needs as, as children um, have needs that are met when they become adults as well. Thank you very much.